Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's conversation. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings, and I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a professor of American Studies and History at the University of Notre Dame. I'm delighted to be moderating this conversation today, just two weeks after a historic inauguration of the second Catholic um, to the American presidency. Here to help us think about why and how this is historic are four colleagues who have spent a great deal of time studying the history of the Catholic Church in the United States. I'm going to introduce them very briefly. I won't do justice to all of their accomplishments. And following some opening remarks by each of our panelists, we will turn to audience questions. We've received a number of questions in advance, but we also invite guests to submit any questions that might surface throughout the webinar using the Q&A tool on your screen. First up, alphabetically speaking, is Dr. Peter Chaika, my colleague in the Department of American Studies here at Notre Dame, where he is an assistant teaching professor and director of undergraduate studies. In April, the University of Chicago Press will publish his book, Follow Your Conscience, the Catholic Church and the Spirit of the 60s. We're very much looking forward to that book. Next is Dr. Teresa Keeley, an assistant professor of history at the University of Louisville. Last September, Cornell University Press published her book, Reagan's Gun-Toting Nuns, the Catholic Conflict over Cold War Human Rights Policy in Central America. Our third panelist is Dr. Stephen Kaith, a Holy Cross priest and a postdoctoral fellow at the Kushwa Center this year. Stephen earned his PhD in history from Columbia University in May of last year, and his dissertation is titled The Suburban Church, Catholic Parishes and Politics in Metropolitan New York, 1945 to 1985, and he's currently revising that into a book manuscript. Last but not least is my colleague, Dr. Cecilia A. Moore, an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Dayton. She is also on the faculty of Xavier University of Louisiana's, sorry, Xavier University of Louisiana's Institute for Black Catholic Studies. It's such a pleasure to have all four of you here with us today, and I want to thank all the participants for joining us. Pete, let's start with you. You recently published a piece uh, comparing the Biden presidency with the presidency of uh, John F. Kennedy in terms of liberal Catholicism. And that piece was titled, The Good Catholic. Can you tell us a little bit about your argument in that piece? Yeah, um, thanks very much. So my brief comments are just gonna attempt to place Biden in the story of, of liberal Catholicism. Um, liberal Catholics in America have long uh, sought to be optimistic about American ideas. Um, and in this sense, we can see Biden as part of a much deeper past. He has many forerunners. Um, we can see him drawing upon the dreams of the 19th century Americanists um, who campaigned in the decades just after the Civil War convinced the church to champion values like toleration, pluralism, and the separation of church and state. Um, Biden echoes what John F. Kennedy told the Houston Ministerial Association in 1961. Um, that while the Catholicism shapes his life, um, shapes his values, um, it does not dictate his political decisions. Um, we could hear him talking and expressing this liberal Catholicism, I think, in, in 2012 really well in the vice presidential debate uh, when he was asked about abortion. Biden expressed how he accepted the judgment of the church in his personal life, uh, but refused to impose it on equally devout Christians and Muslims and Jews. Um, and that turn of phrase, uh, the refusal to impose, I think it captures, it encapsulates the major sort of program of liberal Catholicism. And I see him as an authentic liberal Catholic. Um, there are two ways I think that works. And, and the first is this, is that publicly he speaks a language of democracy um, and sort of privately and in his own, he has a, like a robust spiritual life, right? He goes to mass, he invokes the saints. Um, he can offer quick exegeses of St. Paul's letters um, on the fly, it's very impressive. Um, his public language is about unity, uh, building back better um, for all Americans, right? So he speaks his public language of democracy at the same time as he has this robust spiritual life. And I think there's a deep continuity to this liberal Catholicism, but I feel like liberal Catholicism entered a new era um, with sexual politics after the 1970s, right? Today, it's a risk to be a liberal Catholic in some ways, um, especially on the issue of abortion. And this is kind of my second definition of what it means to be a liberal Catholic and a good Catholic beyond um, this idea of public private divide is to say, you accept choice, you accept the reality of a messy democratic society, even as you hold out the value 
that you would like people to make what you see as the right choice, right? So liberal Catholicism accepts the reality of choice on religion and personal moral matters on a lot of ways, but wants people to make the, what they see as the right choice. Um, even if this Catholicism hopes people will make this virtual choice while they are offered their personal uh, sexual freedom and autonomy, um, it has these tensions within it. And this seems to be why, the criticism of this seems to be widespread, it's growing. Um, parish priests and bishops have been critical of this liberal Catholic approach, um, particularly when it comes to abortion. Um, and like, you know, liberal Catholics of earlier eras, good Catholics of earlier eras, um, in this definition, engendered criticism this way too. This will not go away. I think this will continue. Um, Professor Cummings was quoted in an ABC News article recently, um, a few days ago, that was quite telling. It was a, sort of a host of critics and a host of people who praise Biden. I think liberal Catholics like that are very polarizing. Um, it's all just conclude with one brief ref reflection. You might call it a provocation, right? Um, I think the greatest strength of this position of, of liberal Catholicism is its practicality. Um, it's pragmatic. It's designed a smart way to shape the common good using Catholic values while living within a democratic secular context. Um, it, it accepts a political reality that dates back to the Reformation um, and the democratic revolutions of the 18th century, which gave us things we like, like separation of powers, separation of church and state, republicanism and democracy. Um, but its weakness might be the consistency or the lack of consistency of its moral witness, right? You cannot say that abortion is wrong publicly, even when you believe it, um, as the logic goes from the church's perspective and a consistent ethic, how can you criticize other moral issues, right? Like immigration, neoliberal capitalism, environmental destruction or healthcare, right? I think the liberal Catholic position um, has to be fuller and more robust on all of these fronts simultaneously to build a good world, to, to be both a critic of the econo economic neoliberal era, but also a critic of violations of human dignity and life. And I think this speaks to a central question of American history, right? Can Catholicism be made liberal, right? That's something that, that Americans have been wondering for a long time. And I think under Biden's watch, it has to be, right? But can it be, right? And I think that is the paradox and the question that will continue to sort of confront him as a liberal Catholic going forward. Thanks, Pete, for starting us off. Uh, that is a lot of, uh, a lot provocative in that. Terry, I wanna to move to you now. Um, so you obviously have written about US Catholics in between the Kennedy and Biden presidencies. Catholics didn't, uh, were not absent uh, from American politics uh, hardly in those decades. Could you help us think about the changes in the world and the nation in between JFK and Biden presidencies and how they might've affected US Catholicism and how in turn changes in Catholicism may have impacted U.S. foreign policy. I think you're muted. Again. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am an unexperienced Zoom person. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to Kushwa for inviting me and to my co-panelists and to everyone here viewing whom I can't see. And now you can hear me since I've mastered the art of the mute button. As Kathy mentioned, I'm a historian who focuses on US foreign relations. So the short answer, if we're thinking about changes from the JFK to the Biden presidency is to say the Cold War has ended. Relations between the United States and Russia today are tense, but it is not the same as it was. In the few minutes I have now, I'm going to focus on three moments when we can see continuity in terms of Catholic debates over US foreign relations and change in terms of Catholics access to political power. To be an American during the Cold War meant to be anti-communist. Catholics were the quintessential anti-communists, making them patriotic Americans. But there were cracks in this Catholic anti-communism and not all Catholics maintained diehard anti-communist views throughout the Cold War. During the Kennedy presidency, the United States was involved in Vietnam as it had been since the Truman years. It did not become a full-scale war until Johnson and it was not until early 1968 that more than half of Americans opposed the war. Catholics disagreed over the war and they disagreed even over the protest tactics among those who opposed the war. Some Catholics burnt their draft cards, others raided draft boards and destroyed files. These divisions became a political opportunity. After the shootings at Kent State University in May of 1970, President Nixon worked to bring voters disillusioned by the Democratic Party and by these anti-war protests into the Republican Party. These were white, 
working class voters, and many of them were Catholics. In the 1970s, Catholics disagreements over Cold War policy involved their conflicting views of human rights. Should the United States support leaders who violated the human rights of their people? Or should the United States support anti-communist governments because communism was the greatest violation of human rights? Catholics clashed over US support for leaders in predominantly Catholic countries. We can think about General Pinochet in Chile or Somoza in Nicaragua or even Marcos in the Philippines. These divides pitted the likes of William F. Buckley and Phyllis Schlafly on one hand against Marinol missioners on the other. To Catholics who regarded communism as the number one violation of human rights, Jimmy Carter was no friend in the White House. In the late 1970s, and especially in the 1980s, US intervention in Central America, another predominantly Catholic region, became a flashpoint for US Catholics. Catholics again divided over the human rights implications of US foreign policy. Was the unrest caused by communism or was it inspired by poverty and inequality? But there was an added twist liberation theology. Many US officials, including those in the Carter administration, regarded liberation theology as religious extremism that inspired revolution akin to what occurred in Iran in 1979. Simply put, to them, they saw liberation theology as a US national security threat. To some Catholics, because liberation theology borrowed from Marxist analysis, it was communism. To others, liberation theology built on the notion of people as church by recognizing societal inequalities and the dignity of the poor. Unlike the 1960s and the 70s, however, these Catholic debate, debates were front and center in US politics because Catholics played key roles in shaping Reagan's policies while other Catholics were instrumental in opposing them. The Cold War's end has removed this singular focus for US foreign relations, but it has not ended Catholics disagreements. As the campaign and the discussion since have made clear, not all Catholics see the world the way Joe Biden does. To me, it is more relevant to discuss what kind of Catholic Joe Biden is, who will be aiding in his decision-making process, and what this potentially means for political access it, for Catholics like him rather than to simply say the second Catholic is in the White House. Because after all, conservative Catholics did not need a Catholic in the White House to promote their foreign policy views during the Reagan years. Thanks, Terry. Uh, we'll probably come back to you with a question about Biden's cabinet, and in particular, the Catholics in the cabinet who will be part of the people advising him. So thank you very much for that. Stephen, let's turn to you. Um, you have written about the Bishop's Conference, uh, Richard Nixon in the 1960 election, and of course your dissertation research is focused on suburbanization and its effects on American Catholic politics. How are you thinking about the similarity and contrast between then JFK and now Joe Biden, according to those two lines of research? Yeah, I'm, I actually uh, begin to think about the similarities first. Um, and uh, I think that they've maybe been missed by focusing on the dissimilarities. The similarities that jump out at me right off the bat is the division within the Bishop's Conference, even at in the 1960s, about Kennedy's candidacy. Uh, it masked by the fact that 80% of Catholics or near 80% of Catholics end up voting for Kennedy. Uh, and now we see, oh, there's this division in the Bishop's Conference between Francis Bishops and Benedict or JP2 bishops, uh, all, all true. And yet I think we miss that uh, Cardinal Spellman was not particularly keen on John F. Kennedy's uh, candidacy. Francis McIntyre, James Frank Francis McIntyre was not particularly keen on uh, Kennedy's candidacy over the perception that he wasn't as strong as an anti-communist as he could have been, over perceptions that he was not going to support uh, the bishop's request for funding for uh, Catholic schools from the state and from the federal government uh, and, on, and on other issues. Um, so that's one. And the second, I think we uh, might want to think about how uh, close an election 1960 was 
and how close uh, this election was, right? Um, to the point where uh, Nixon never does this publicly the way Donald Trump did, but Nixon's surrogates question the validity of the election, right? David Greenberg has written very well about this uh, recently. Uh, so I think that's another similarity, but undoubtedly, uh, although these similarities are worth noting, I think the difference does jump out. 80% of Catholics vote for, for Kennedy. And uh, when John Kerry runs, he loses the Catholic vote narrowly. When Biden runs, uh, he wins the Catholic vote uh, narrowly. So I think the question is, uh, as Terry kind of got at, how do we get from there to here? I take a different approach and look at suburbanization as a way to, to answer this. Um, one, and a way to answer this because it helps us get at other changes. The rise of uh, Catholic educational attainment, thanks in large part to the GI Bill. Uh, the rise of Catholic income, thanks to the booming post-war economy. Um, the collapse of the urban ethnic enclave. Uh, all of these at the, at the end of kind of subculture Catholicism in some sense. All of that is encapsulated by uh, studying suburbanization. Studying uh, the suburbs also gets at uh, the way that uh, the laity and the clergy's relationship changed, the way that sacramental practice changed uh, in ways that anticipate the Second Vatican Council. Um, but perhaps there's no better way to get at how the suburbs changed American Catholic politics than by looking at the issue of, of schooling. Um, long before the post-war period, the hope had been that every Catholic student be educated in a parochial school, uh, but precisely because of the post-war baby boom and the move to the suburbs, the chances of that actually happening uh, drop even more. Uh, between 1950 and 1960, the number of American Catholics grows by 36%, and that accounts for 41% of the nation's population growth. growth. So there's this need to uh, provide Catholic schools for an even larger number of, of, of Catholic students. And although a, an impressive number of Catholic schools, Catholic parishes are built at this time, I focus my study, as you mentioned, on New York. And between 1957 and 1962 alone, 26 new elementary schools, four new high schools are built, 38 uh, elementary schools are uh, renovated. There's still no way that they're going to be able to provide enough desks for Catholic students. At the same time, and for some of the reasons of changes in Catholicism that I mentioned, um, religious women are increasingly not available to serve in those uh, Catholic schools. And so uh, this kind of forces uh, an economic crisis with which the bishops respond to by advancing even further their request for state and federal funding. Um, it puts parents in a bind as tuition rises, uh, so too does property taxes in the suburbs. In Nassau and Suffolk County, which I study between 1950 and 1960, uh, property taxes increased by 450%. Um, all of these things kind of come to a head in 1967 in New York, when the state tries to pass a new state constitution, which would have repealed the Blaine Amendment in the state and allowed for state funding for private schools. And yet, the referendum is overwhelmingly rejected, uh, even in majority Catholic uh, areas. And the, it becomes clear that in a certain sense, the Catholic bloc, if it existed, uh, is kind of fracturing. Uh, and it's fracturing along the lines of uh, voting a pocketbook, uh, voting their economic and tax issues. It kind of indicates um, a kind of Reagan revolution and a tax revolt that was coming. And finally, uh, of course, I think most historians kind of tend to then look towards abortion politics in a slightly later date. And that's certainly true as a, as a crucially important dividing point in American Catholicism. But the culture wars debate kind of starts even before, and it too starts in schools. It starts with 10 commandments in the schools and prayer in the schools. And suburban Catholics that I study play a pivotal role in that moment as well. So I think that this that, that suburbanization helps us get at the way that American Catholics politically split down the middle to the point where they really are this classic suburban swing vote. Thank you, Stephen. It, it's clear why your dissertation won the John Tracy Ellis Dissertation Award. And, uh, we're all looking forward to, to seeing it uh, published as, as a book. 
Cecilia, you uh, teach and write about uh, African American religion, and your research focuses on the history of Black Catholics. And it's, of course, as you teach both at Dayton and at Xavier. Could you help us think about uh, the Biden presidency in, in that context? Sure. Um, thank Yes. And I'm, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be able to participate. We're thrilled to have you. Okay. Well, um, I think it's important. This is a story that I'm sure people who um, studied Kennedy know very well, but I don't think a lot of people know this story. Um, a few weeks before the election in 1960, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested um, for protesting with 75 other people um, at a white at a restaurant that only would serve whites. It wasn't his first time getting arrested, um, but this time it really troubled his wife because she was pregnant and she thought that she wasn't going to see him come home. Civil rights leaders, as well as his brother-in-law, our Sergeant Shriver, got involved. They appealed to John Kennedy to help her. They emphasized that if he answered her call, that it would only redound to his benefit. It would show Black people that he cared and that he wanted to be a part of the change for good. If Black people saw him acting compassionately towards the King family, they argued, he would be able to speak to the hearts of Black people. He did call Mrs. King. Dr. King was released alive. And it is likely um, this, this, uh, this uh, event is likely one of the things that helped swing the majority of the black vote in 1960 to Kennedy. And that vote was crucial for his very narrow win. Blacks who voted for him thought that he would be a strong partner for them in the cause for civil rights. And when he formed his administration, he did appoint blacks to key positions and strengthen the Civil Rights Commission. But he wasn't able to deliver a lot during his presidency that would directly advance civil rights legislation. He had that narrow margin. He didn't have much of a cushion in Congress when it came to pushing. And a lot of the Democrats were from the South. In 1963, he did welcome religious leaders who were supportive of civil rights to the White House. And among the invited was Father Harold Perry who at the time was the uh, provincial for the Southern province of the Society of the Divine Word. Two years later, Father Perry would become the first African-American in the 20th century to be ordained a bishop in the United States. Now, a little over 60 years later, President Biden, um, the second Catholic president of the United States, began his inaugural ceremonies with a memorial uh, for more than for the more than 400,000 Americans who have died from COVID since winter 2020. And he invited Cardinal Wilton Gregory, America's first black cardinal, to lead the prayers. Well acquainted with grief, Biden is acutely aware of the pain and suffering that's related to this pandemic, as well as the virulent racism that's plaguing the country. He seems to be leaning hard on his faith and his relationships with African Americans to address both, starting with selecting Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. And now, of course, she is our first Black, Asian, and woman vice president. His cabinet is heavily Catholic, and he has Blacks serving in key roles, including the first Black Secretary of Defense, Secretary Lloyd Austin, who also is Catholic. Like Kennedy, Biden's final um, victory was made possible by this incredibly high um, Black vote, particularly the vote of Black women who have made, uh, who made possible uh, through women like Stacey Abrams, she's not the only one who did this, but she's our lead, the leader, um, winning this key, this key state of Georgia. Um, Biden, I think, is well aware of how much 
um, his presidency relied upon um, the support of Black people. Blacks are suffering a lot. And because of that, we're expecting a lot from him and Vice President Harris. So far as executive orders um, have canceled a lot of things that President Trump did that harmed black, brown, and poor people. Um, so those, those things are looking good to us and we welcome them. But the wounds are deep and they're ancient and a lot more is gonna be um, demanded of them. So hopefully when President uh, Biden and Vice President Harris need to refocus and renew their energies and commitments, they can turn to the poem that the young Black and Catholic poet laureate Amanda Gorman offered in The Hill We Climb to gain strength and inspiration for the fight ahead. Thank you, Cecilia. Since, since you brought up Amanda Gorman, um, that wonderful poem, um, and an optimistic poem, uh, mm -hmm. let's begin with a question that uh, relates to how optimistic we should be moving into a Biden presidency. So we have a question from Jason Duncan, who wonders if it's possible that President Biden will use his considerable political skills to engage a wide range of the US Catholic community not only those clergy and laity that might agree with him on contentious matters, particularly abortion. Is there reason for optimism? Uh, and many of the questions have actually focused on how plausible is it that Biden can help unite a polarized church and nation? Does anybody wanna take that one? <laughs> I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, I don't envy Biden, I would say, first of all, that is no easy task, whether it's thinking about this just in political terms or in Catholic terms. One thing that I think will hamstring him is his own approach. He's a very person-to-person -person type of, the, how do I say this, COVID and the restrictions on people being in close proximity, I think will hamper his efforts in the sense that he's someone that likes to have personal close contact. And so I think one thing he would have to do is figure out how he's gonna work around that in the COVID setting. In terms of the church and politics, I think, I believe he really will try. I think I, in terms of the way he's speaking, I know lots of politicians talk about red states, blue states, purple states, trying to bring people together. I think he will attempt to do that. I think if he could take concrete steps in terms of maybe inviting to the White House people from the opposing side, as he may see it, just as he's trying to do with members of Congress, he could try to do that with members of the Catholic community who would not be likely to share his views. I think that could be a public gesture that communicates to more than the people he's inviting that he's making an attempt. That would be my, my first piece of advice. But that's, it's a, Harry, I'm gonna, since we have the spotlight on you, I'm gonna stay with you for a question that came from Brian Kleitz, um, which encourages us to think about Catholics and American politics uh, in the executive branch beyond just the presidency alone. Uh, obviously, there have been many Catholics in prior presidential administrations, and fully uh, Biden's, Biden has appointed about one third of his cabinet members are Catholic. Do you have a sense of how this Biden team stacks up in terms of its overall representation of American religious diversity? Is this the most Catholic Oval Office uh, in American history? Well, the first thing I would say is that the numbers are a little different. If we look at percentages, it's easy to say, oh, well, 20% of Kennedy's cabinet was Catholic. But Kennedy's Catholic or Kennedy's cabinet in terms of numbers was much smaller than what a cabinet is today. So the percentage is a little different. You could have 20% with Kennedy and have three people. <laughs> um, in terms of actual numbers with Biden, there are, are more people. Um, he's 
Obama had around 32%, I think, if I remember the numbers correctly, and George H.W. Bush had close to that too. So I think what's more relevant in terms of thinking about Catholic influence is also what those positions are. Cecilia mentioned earlier, um, cabinet positions and Catholics in the past have tended to have positions that are more domestically focused. I think what's interesting about some of Biden's choices, Harry, for example, this is a new position, but thinking about climate change, that's something that connects both issues happening domestically and in terms of foreign relations. And he's also interesting for me to think about because of his faith and the way that he's interested in incorporating some of the ideas that Pope Francis has talked about in terms of the environment. Whereas just labeling someone with Catholic doesn't necessarily tell us a whole lot. If we look at a different example in Reagan's cabinet, there were people very involved in shaping foreign policy, to go back to what I was saying earlier, who had a very particular view of what communism should be and what the Catholic Church should be, and they really put their stamp on that. So I think it's not just a numbers game, but thinking about what their faith means to these people in the cabinet and how they see it playing out and being an influence on their worldview. Thank you. We had a question from Edgar Guzman about uh, the role of the Bishops' Conference in terms of the presidency. And here again, a similarity and difference. Stephen, because you've written on this, I'm going to ask you, how did the NCWC, later USCCB, play a role in Kennedy's presidency? And how can we expect that to be different in a Biden presidency? Yeah, well, to start, uh, even before uh, Kennedy, uh, the role that the NCWC played in uh, the Nixon ca uh, candidacy, not so much during the campaign, but prior to the campaign, one of uh, Richard Nixon's closest confidants, speechwriters, advisors, was Father John Cronin, who worked uh, for the Bishops' Conference with Monsignor George Higgins in the Social Action Department. Um, that the Bishops' Conference was, was willing <laughs> to see itself as not being involved in politics. There was a kind of a bright line that was supposed to be held about not you know, uh, being involved in political campaigns, but to be uh, inserting members of the NCWC uh, staff uh, in as advisors, as consultants, providing information for candidates and for uh, office holders. Um, the, the deeply involved in, in a certain sense in, in, the, in the 1960s. Uh, how much we're gonna see that today? I, I think much less um, uh, for several different reasons. Um, perhaps the primary one, unfortunately, being that at this point, the Bishops' Conference is hobbled by the fact that they have uh, had their moral standing so compromised by uh, the sexual abuse crisis. Um, certainly divisions within American Catholicism and the fact that there isn't the Catholic bloc, as I mentioned earlier, would also limit a politician's interest in going to the bishops as being representatives of this bloc and courting that vote. That said, I do think that uh, Joe Biden is certainly uh, interested or should, we would likely be interested in working with the bishops on a number of issues from immigration to the environment, healthcare, etc. Um, the Focus has been on uh, the Archbishop Gomez's letter, uh, which was seen to have been critical of Biden. It certainly got got to that point, but before it, before it got critical, it, it laid out a number of places where the bishops uh, certainly would be uh, open to working uh, and supporting uh, Biden's policies. Now, my sense is that Joe Biden likes to say how his faith influences his politics. Those might be places where he's willing to accept that advice and that uh, you know working together. So that's back to an optimistic view. Uh, <laughs> I, I try. <laughs> well, what you brought up, uh, because you brought up Nixon, that we have another uh, interesting point made by John Nolan, who um, said that Nixon argued that Kennedy gained more votes from Catholics than he lost from anti-Catholics. Does the data support that? You know, there's a debate about it, but I think that ultimately historians have sided with the fact that yes, it actually helped Kennedy more than it hurt him. Uh, a lot of people go back to 
the Sorensen Bailey memo in 1956, kind of arguing that Kennedy should have been the vice presidential candidate at that time, making the case that uh, a Catholic candidacy would not have been undermining. Uh, and then they look at the results of the 1960 election and see that Kennedy does carry the East and the Midwest with the exception of Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Uh, in New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, all states that he carries huge Catholic votes in the urban areas outweigh uh, any kind of uh, uptick that Nixon would have had in rural areas that would have been influenced by anti-Catholicism. Uh, and that carries across the nation. In the 12 largest cities across the country with large Catholic populations, uh, the vote for uh, Kennedy exceeds the vote for Stevenson in 1956 by 24% increase in New Orleans, a 23% increase in Buffalo, a 21% percent increase in Boston. So you see that although there's any number of people who voted against Kennedy because of his Catholicism, I, the feeling is that it's more than offset by Catholics who did come together as a block to vote for him uh, in 1960. So that raises a question about anti-Catholicism as a force in American politics. And this is a question asked by Bill Cosson, who points out that it was such a salient feature of American politics for most of our nation's history. To what extent is it still uh, a force? So that's, that's a question anyone can respond to, but I wanna, um, I uh, then wanna follow up with a question directed um, to Pete about uh, Biden's Catholicism and how it might affect a border question in Ireland. So uh, we'll we'll pivot to that. But first, question thoughts about anti-Catholicism more general, more generally. Is it still a salient force in American politics? I'd quickly just answer, and then I'll, I'll then I'll turn myself off. Uh, I I think it is. It's still a powerful force, though it too has been. It's been uh, some of its power has been lessened. Uh, I think it it unfortunately, like everything else, it divides along left right divides. Right. Uh, so Joe Biden wasn't at risk of not being nominated by the Democratic Party because he was a Catholic. Um, he wasn't really at risk of not being elected by the general population because he was a Catholic. Uh, and yet anti-Catholicism can still rear its head, whether it be um, kind of a, 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 um, from the right, whether Biden is sufficiently Catholic, is he really a Catholic? Uh, and then um, from, from the left, uh, from the progressive left especially, one has to wonder how open will the progressive left be to Joe Biden working with the Bishop's Conference or other Catholic leaders on the environment or on other issues because of the way that uh, the American bishops and American Catholicism would differ from the progressive left on abortion, on transgenderism, et cetera. Is, is there gonna be kind of a cancel culture, so to speak, exerted on certain Catholic voices? It's possible. And anti-Catholicism would be tied into that, though it's undoubtedly true that it's not the same force that it was in 1960. Just to piggyback on that real quick. Um, I mean, I think Biden's election just seems a lot less surprising to us because of all the Catholics who have power in Washington right now in all sorts of other realms. Um, the Supreme Court is stacked with Catholics. Nancy Pelosi, I think it's up to like 20 senators. Um, I don't quite recall what, what the status of all that was in 1960, but I will guess it was severely, significantly less. Um, there's no Paul Blanchard right now, public intellectual, although there's like the subtle anti-Catholicism in a lot of writing. So I just think, you know, it's not that surprising that, someone, that there's a second Catholic president in terms of like anti, it's, it's just, it's, to answer that question, I just think that um, it's been anticipated in so many other realms of the federal government, right? Uh, where it would be, the Supreme Court right now makes no sense by the standards of 1960, right? So I think just the election of a Catholic president is just not as provocative as it would have been in 1960, to, to jump on what Stephen's good points here. We have a comment from Mara Jane Farrelly, who is a scholar of anti-Catholicism herself, and, and expressing some optimism, suggests that might there be something in the unremarkable nature of Biden's faith in his presidency? Might that be something that could give young people who are pushing for change and justice in this country hope that once marginalized, a once marginalized group doesn't necessarily translate into always marginalized? Um, but then she wonders, and Cecilia, I, I'm gonna direct this question to you. Is the issue of racial injustice just too different from the issue of religious bigotry to be a useful parallel, parallel in this situation? Thoughts on that? Okay, um, 
One of the things that I was thinking about when I was uh, preparing my remarks was um, I was thinking about how Kennedy's Catholicism for African Americans, um, I think for, for some of them, they, they, they looked at his election and did think, well, wow, if a Catholic could become president, maybe I could, because there was this, this uh, anti-Catholicism that had plagued him through his election and, and you know, other Catholic politicians who um, had sought like Al Smith. Um, so I think that that was something that was relatable about Kennedy, that he was from a, a minority group, whether they were numerically minor really a minority, truly a minority or not, but they were really viewed as still outsiders in 1960s by a lot of people, especially where a lot of the black voters were. Um, so I think Kennedy did kind of help, his election helped black people to think, well, maybe this is something that could happen for me too. Um, in terms of race, I don't know if I'm answering this question well or not, but I think it is interesting that um, Joe Biden is part of the second black Catholic White House. You know, we had eight, we had an eight year black and Catholic White House and we have another black and Catholic White House. Um, I think in his own biography, you know, there are challenging things about Biden and race. But there are also things um, from the time he's a pretty young person where he has a strong consciousness about justice, racial justice, um, and sees that as a factor that brought him into politics. Um, I, it will be interesting to me to see if he will be treated the same way that Barack Obama was. Will he, um, will, will, they, will they allow him to succeed? Um, he feels very confident that they will. <laughs> um, I just remember him saying, don't worry, you know, they'll, 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 they'll come around, they'll come around. They did by the hair of their chinny chin chins, <laughs> really. Um, and a, a lot of it remains to be seen. So I, I know that was all over the place, no, but that was I, great. I, I hope it helped That's with a great that. Answer, and I think a hopeful one. So uh, Peter McAvoy raises a question, as I mentioned a, a, a minute ago, about where Catholicism might present a problem for Biden um, if he is forced to intervene in, say, uh, the Brexit issue in terms of the border. So, um, Pete, I'm going to start with you, but I'll also see if Terry wants to hop in as a... Um, yeah, that's my uh, father-in-law. That's why, yeah. If yeah, I um, he's tuning in from Northern Ireland right now. Um, I, I'll kind of speculate just briefly. Um, it could, it could, I don't, that's a great question. I mean, I, I wonder too about his, the background of being an Irish Catholic, um, how that would matter if ethnicity is a layer here as well. Um, I think Stephen would have something to say on that as well. Um, but you could, I mean, it's the anti-Catholic thing is interesting too, because anti-Catholicism can be very strong in Northern Ireland coming at Catholics. So you could certainly see that becoming a, a political caricature and having some, some legs um, in terms of like a political sort of casting him in a certain light as, as pro-Irish, pro-Republic, right? Um, but this is, you know, Colin Barr is in the crowd. I would, I wish he could text me an answer to this question. Um, uh, but that's, you know, that I would, that's just kind of speculation, but you could see it affecting geopolitics, but I, I wonder about the layer of ethnicity here and Irish Catholics. And, and I think that speaks to, to Stephen's research too, in the sense of um, the diminution of a Catholic bloc, which would have been, you know, in, especially in the New York area, very Irish from what I understand. But yeah, that's the attempt at an answer. Terry, any thoughts? I actually agree with Pete. The thing that popped into my head too was that a lot of Catholics in the 80s who were on board with Reagan's Central America policy were also pro-independent Ireland. The fault lines are really messy. So this could actually be an area where Biden might find common ground with Catholics in the U.S. that he wouldn't normally find common ground with um, on other issues, but um, 
I agree with Pete. I think he would probably be more likely to be seen as someone coming in as an Irish Catholic, not as the U.S. president, it, it, first and foremost. He wouldn't be seen in the way Bill Clinton was, was seen, for example. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Chris Temple that I really like, and I'm going to actually try to answer it myself, usurping the, my panelist um, role today. But Chris asks, how to account for the private Latari Medal presentation ceremony to John F. Kennedy in 1961 and its very public presentation to Joe Biden in 2016? If there's anyone on this call that doesn't know what the Latari Medal is, where have you been? Um, no, the Latari Medal is the self-proclaimed highest honor that an American Catholic can receive and has been bestowed by the University of Notre Dame every year since 1883. So Chris, I'm gonna offer some thoughts and then panelists feel free to jump in. I mean, practically speaking, the Latari Medal wasn't routinely distributed at commencement until the 1970s. So Biden uh, receiving it at commencement was, was just by that point had been tradition, but John F. Kennedy received it in a private ceremony in the Oval Office, which was fairly typical that, that the president of Notre Dame would go to where the recipient was. But I do think there is a question here and that I just rewatched uh, then Vice President Joe Biden's acceptance of the Latari Medal in 2016, which he received jointly with then Speaker of the House John Boehner, a Democrat and Republican attempt to bridge the, uh, the divide. But I was struck by the fact that he called it the greatest award he had ever received, the Latari Medal. Maybe he was just playing to the audience like a good, <laughs> like a good politician. But I think it did mean a lot to him. He was certainly convincing. Whereas for Kennedy, you, could, you don't imagine that he cared all that much about this honor bestowed by, uh, by Notre Dame. Is that a way to think about the differences between them? Is, is, is for Joe Biden, his Catholicism is something he's much more willing to celebrate publicly, whereas you couldn't see Kennedy advertising this, um, that, that private ceremony. Is there anyone else want to do uh, more justice to Chris Temple's question than I just did? No, did I? <laughs> I think I think you did great justice to it. I think that's why we're all qu so quiet. <laughs> no, I think it's, it goes back to that question about anti-Catholicism, right? I mean, of course, Kennedy wanted to downplay the fact that Father Hesburgh was flying to D.C. to present this award in 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 the Oval Office. He didn't want to come to South Bend and have to be at this large Catholic pageant, um, and uh, it, it, that wasn't going to hurt Joe Biden in the same way. That said, I think it's also the uh, fair, the point that you make, there is a difference on the level of, 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 of piety. That's not to say John Kennedy wasn't a, you know, a, a sufficiently Catholic, but though, I mean, even Jackie O said, uh, you know, all these people attacking him, he's such a poor Catholic. You know, if they, if they were saying this about Bobby, I'd kind of understand, you know. Um, but it, I do think that that Biden is perhaps a little bit more comfortable I with his piety and perhaps is is more pious himself, you know. Um, but the uh, the ability to portray it, I think, goes to the anti-Catholicism question. Leslie Tentler, in her recent history of American Catholics, characterizes John F. Kennedy as a lukewarm Catholic with her inimitable tact. Uh, Cecilia, that's a question that Anne Clement raised in a pre-submitted question about whether the Black Catholic community, or perhaps more broadly, the Black Christian community, uh, was concerned about how Catholic JFK was. Um, were they, was the Black Catholic community concerned as perhaps some in the white Catholic community were, con were concerned uh, back in 1960? I I haven't I haven't come across any um, black Catholics expressing uh, you know doubts about about him. Um, so the point that you made earlier as a cat, yeah, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. I do know that um, you know also part of that story, uh, the the first story I told. One of the parts of the story is that. Um, King's father was a, a Republican because a lot, a lot of blacks who had voted for a long time had been Republicans um, related to you know the party of Lincoln, all of that. Um, that he is, that the King's father was supposed to have said um, after Kennedy got involved with um, helping um, Martin gain release 
um, something like I've got a sack full of votes and I think I'm going to go place them at the feet of John F. Kennedy. Um, meaning, um, you know, black, some blacks were not really that comfortable with Catholicism. Um, and that state that that story, I think, reflects those who were who may have felt that way. Um, but uh, I think that the, another part of the question, I think, is about, you know, him not being such a perfect person, mm -hmm. you know, that 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 he had he had his faults. And and that is something that I, I mean, I, I do I do think is in our tradition as um, black people, especially as it comes to things like religion and politics, um, there's a lot of forgiveness. <laughs> there's just, there's just, there just seems to be um, a willingness for African Americans to forgive and to um, kind of adopt this this understanding that everybody everybody falls down everybody we've all got issues <laughs> but if you're the person who i feel most confident about in supporting the things that are going to help my community then um those are things that i don't need to scrutinize so carefully um and so there, there are a lot of the catholic criticism from my understanding of Kennedy was, you know, this is he's that he's this lukewarmness. He's not really a Catholic. He doesn't do this. He doesn't. And yeah, no, I don't think that's not, I'm not going to say that that black voters never like analyze a person that way, but much less. And, and in, po in politics, it always is surprising the people that, um, that, 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 that African American voters give a second chance. Thanks for that. We have a lot of sisters on this call, as far as I can tell. So I was thinking about Joe Biden uh, talking about how he grew up uh, being taught by two different congregations of sisters and was taught to obey them. Uh, what about his relationship with American women religious um, and, and how might that be different from um, from the Kennedy era? Uh, Terry, why don't we start with you and then and then maybe Stephen, you could jump in unmuted myself this time. <laughs> in terms of the sisters Kennedy versus now, their, their role in the church and in the world, I think, is very different. Biden has a working relationship with Sister Simone Campbell. I think that will be important in terms of him having connections to women religious. And I think being connected to groups like network will also give him a different perspective than he might typically get from just the average government worker. Um, it's also different in the sense that it presents women as knowledgeable about issues, whether they're domestic issues or foreign issues, but also as standing in for the church. They're showing a different way that you can have leadership within the Catholic church. And I think that's an important symbolism as well for Biden to recognize that type of relationship. And it's also something that I think he will likely face blowback from for the Catholics who already have a problem with Biden, I don't think will be too happy to see him working with sisters like Sister Simone. So it, it, it's another way that I think it will, it, it shows how important his faith is to him, his willingness to consider other points of view, but also to be mindful of how it's controversial at the same time within the Catholic community. <laughs> And as, uh, as you alluded to, so much has changed for women religious. And we had a question from a James Keeley about a Vatican II and how did the Second Vatican Council um, 
shape the, the different presidencies and not having happened before Biden was elected. Uh, Stephen, any thoughts about that, about Kennedy's relationship with um, women religious? He was taught by, with, taught by them. Did he obey them too? Did he listen to them? Were, was there any context in which he interacted with them? Yeah, I, I'm, I, his educational background wouldn't have involved very many religious women. And so I think that's a difference that Biden has this kind of deep affection for uh, Catholic religious women. Um, I think Kennedy could easily have been pushed forward on civil rights the way that much, much of the church was pushed forward on civil rights because of religious women. Uh, if I was positive earlier, maybe I would be a little bit more negative on this piece, just in the sense that uh, I think that one of the areas where this will be harder for Biden will be, will is whether or not he'll take back up the Ob Obama administration's contraceptive mandate uh, controversy with the Little Sisters of the Poor. Um, it would be, a, uh, although Terry mentioned a point of contact with Sister Simone, maybe this is also a point of, of controversy and debate as, as Terry herself indicated. Again, go, goes to the deep polarization, unfortunately. So I think that relates to a question that has come in from Tom Kasselman about the relationship between a Catholic president and a very Catholic Supreme Court uh, who recently added uh, another Catholic. And this is uh, likely, uh, who is my colleague um, here, uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Um, how is this likely to play out? And in that sense, does Catholicism matter so much or is party divide um, overriding this? This is a this is a big one and probably uh, deserves far more time than we have. But any thoughts? Just to take a, a little, just to throw something out there. Um, I mean, I, it kind of relates to what Anne Van Dyke was asking um, about liberals versus post liberals, in some ways. Um, but I can see the judiciary and the and the, the executive are, are going to have two different types of Catholics working within them on different sort of intellectual political worlds on that realm, but I could see, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question in the sense that I think Biden, it, to, to, to ask the question, for, for Biden, I think this liberal Catholic project is a good project, an optimistic project. I'm, I'm personally pessimistic. I would have waited with some pessimism to start here. But I wonder, yeah, I just wonder how that is gonna play out going forward. And, but Amy Comey Barrett also has this sort of Catholic intellectual background, this deep piety a deep concern about the death penalty. There, there's gonna be some overlaps there with concerns about life, but they're gonna diverge on this abortion question. And what that's gonna mean for the executive judicial branch is gonna be interesting. But those are, I think those are two very serious like Catholic minds and Catholic imaginations that coalesce and diverge in, in really interesting and unique ways. So we're moving from uh, the past into the present and uh, the very quickly approaching future. And uh, we're also coming to the end of our hour. Um, so, what I'd like to do now is, first of all, thank um, all of you, Pete, Terry, Stephen, and Cecilia, for joining us and for really giving us a lot to think about. It's quite a range of topics that we explored in a very short time. And I think um, it does, a lot remains to be seen how his Catholicism is going to uh, shape the presidency. So with that in mind, I wanna invite my colleague, Steve Millies, to join us to uh, come on and uh, un unmute himself and turn on his camera. And uh, Stephen is an associate professor of public theology at Catholic Theological Union, where he directs the Bernadine Center. And he's going to just spend the last minute here announcing an initiative that the Kushwa Center and other like-minded centers are uh, will be involved in over the next year or so, exploring exactly what a Biden presidency might mean for the contemporary Catholic moment and this American moment. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks very much. Is my audio okay? All right, excellent. Well, first I wanna thank my colleague and my good friend, Dr. Kathy Sprose Cummings for letting me have a moment here at the end to make this announcement. I promised her and I'm going to promise you that this is going to be brief. A consistent theme in the ministry of Pope Francis has been his call for a better kind of politics. He issued that call in Evangelii Gaudium and in Laudato Si. He devoted a whole chapter of Fratelli Tutti to a better kind of politics. What I'm here to tell you about is a concrete effort to heed Pope Francis's call, to ask what a better kind of politics would look like, and to try to inspire American Catholics to do our part to make that happen in our parishes and in our communities. For quite a while, there's been a conversation underway among Catholic institutions about 
how we might do this. And today we are announcing to you the fruits of that conversation. Over the next year, as Kathy said, at least, we'll be offering programming like you've just seen, Zoom conversations with thoughtful speakers and a chance for you to join in with questions and discussion. The theme of all of these programs will be Pope Francis's call, which we've taken for the name of this effort we're undertaking, a better kind of politics. We're still inviting others to join us. For now, the 13 participating institutions are the Kushwa Center, excuse me, the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism at the University of Notre Dame, America Media, the Bernardin Center at Catholic Theological Union, the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College, the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University, the Garaventa Center for Catholic Intellectual Life and American Culture at the University of Portland, the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage at Loyola University Chicago, the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University, the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California, the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana, the Institute for Catholic Thought and Catholic Culture at Seattle University, the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America, and the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics at the University of Santa Clara. Our hope is to provide programming that brings as much of the diversity of the church in the United States to bear as we can possibly gather and to foster a deep conversation about how we Catholics can build a better political community that seeks justice, mercy, and peace for the common good. But the most important participants are not going to be the sponsoring institutions or the speakers. The most important participants are going to be you. You and all the other Catholics that you can invite to join these conversations to heed Pope Francis's call. We hope we'll be able to count on you to help spread the word. To make that a little easier, let me encourage you to visit our collaborations webpage and visit it often because we'll be adding things throughout 2021. That address is a better kind of politics.org. And I'm putting that in the chat here now to make it easy for you. Pope Francis has emphasized how we should think about politics not as a contest over interests with winners and losers, but as a kind of friendship. This collaboration was born in friendship and we invite you to join us as a friend together through the year ahead as we try to build a better kind of politics. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Steve, and thanks for that initiative. Um, please do visit the website and, and stay tuned. Um, again, uh, it's so wonderful to have so many people joining us. Um, it's, it's great to see uh, people from all over. Uh, one of the upsides, the silver linings of this pandemic is that the Kushwa Center can have an audience much uh, larger than those who live in or are able to drive to South Bend. So thank you all for joining us. And again, a deep thank you to Pete, Terry, Stephen, and Cecilia for helping us think about the this historic moment and uh, really uh, reminding us that uh, being able to situate things in historical context is so important and so helpful. So I'm very grateful to all of you and thank you to everyone who participated.